Hi, everybody. Pete Damaski down here in the corner of your screen, sitting in my dining room, getting ready to to uh, instruct or talk about uh, corporate finance um, session two. And normally, uh, what we what we see in corporate finance is you have an introductory chapter, which you know goes over a bunch of different things, right? Very topical. And then you get into the, the second class, third class of corporate finance is all about again trying to work through the financial statements and understanding the financial statements of the firm. And the bottom line is, is that, you know, I, I kind of look at accounting as a commoditized discipline, but to be very honest with you, accounting is the language of finance. And, you know, we kind of have to have a walking knowledge and a walking appreciation of accounting across the board. And uh, so, so this is what this this is what this session is going to be about. So uh, I might be able to do this in one session, or we'll split it up into two small sessions. And again, myself and Manny, uh, my partner in crime over here, what we'll do is uh, we will then offer another nice segment where we will record actually a discussion of what it is that I'm teaching. So what I want people to know and kind of appreciate is that. You know, we're here and we're giving you value. So we're not ripping you off. We're not doing a five minute spiel and that's going to be enough to carry you through corporate finance. What we're trying to do is we're trying to say, hey, look, we see a weakness and the weakness is, is that a lot of young students, a lot of people going for their first job, a lot of people trying to get that first promotion, second promotion really are battling against the, the issues of the day, which limit the ability for people to gain perspective, right? So again, talking about COVID-19, we've this is April 2021, and we've basically been teaching, sitting in our dining rooms working, uh, just like you see me down on the bottom of the screen. And the fact is, is that this is very disadvantageous for the student because you're all about going in and interviewing and trying to make sure that you're presenting yourself as a value-added resource. And when you don't really have that, hey, I know what's going on in business, or I have an idea of some of the things that you might be interested in business, but you just go in and you talk the basics, that's that's probably not where you want to be. So we're here to, to, to talk about finance and have fun, and hopefully we can project that and you guys will appreciate that. So come on aboard and we'll, we'll start talking more about the financial statements of corporate finance. Um, now, okay, so... I decided to put in an outline slide, right? So this is all good fun. So at the end of the day, what we have here is we have an extension of accounting, okay? And then what I do is I spin this off into actually let's 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 quickly look at some of the financial statements and trying to get how I see the world because this is another thing that you know I mentioned in one of our kickoff videos in terms of. The big New York banks actually want their new hires to be coming in this year, right? So the U.S. banks, especially the European banks, you know, they're more or less saying, "Well, you can still do your first first round course from, you know, online or in our offices." Okay, but the U.S. people are saying, "Wait a second, to develop that perspective." And so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how I look at the financials, and hopefully this adds a little bit. Okay, and that's the perspective about the firm. And the one thing that I say is to develop perspective about the firm is just talk about things. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to really look at that. And I'll give you a prime example. We can never talk about our real jobs in terms of anything specific. But, you know, I've been basically put in charge of another team. And the first thing I do with this other team is I start talking every day. We're going to have a formal call and we're going to talk about fun stuff. And then we're going to then we're going to transition that into talking about finance. And I think that the people are really appreciating this, right? Because it, it opens up this new world to say, hey, we're in this together and we're going to build off each other's skills. So that's what we're going to go with this. So I'm going to go on to my next slide here. And I think that I probably am going to have to put in some numbers on these slides. So when I quote a number, um, you'll appreciate that. Okay. So when we look at financial statements, okay, we really have to understand what we're looking at. We have to understand the game that's being played. Okay. So again, what we have is we have the three financial statements that are always presented in terms of a public corporation. And that is the income statement, 
the balance sheet and the statement of cash flows. And to be very honest with you, like, I really can't tell you that one's more important than the other. What you have to do is you have to utilize these three statements as one set of, you know, resources, one set of data for you to come out and make a judgment about the firm, right? So the bottom line is, is that, you know, when we're looking at these statements, the statements themselves are so different, firm to firm to firm. The disadvantage of you sitting in accounting one through four and tax and corporate and whatever, all the accounting courses that we've had to take as business majors is that, to be honest with you, I haven't done a T account since I was out of college. Not once. But yet we go through a whole two or three semesters of just doing T accounts. Debit, cash, credit accounts, receivable. That's the only one I know. Okay. And so the end of the day, you, you know, what does that teach you? Okay. What it teaches me is that that's a commodity and there's packages now out there that does that automatically. You just take the general ledger of the firm. Here comes a transaction into the firm and the, the transaction automatically gets accounted for properly. And then all those debits and credits come together to create these financial statements. Okay. So that's really the key. Okay. And so the bottom line is, is that we kind of have to look past that and to say, okay, how do I develop insight? Because this is the value. Don't just give me a bunch of data. And, you know, I know that I'm, I, I'm teaching this the same as I teach a class at night when I teach an MBA program. And, and people seem to appreciate this is that we can bring this stuff home to real life stuff. Okay. You have a weather forecaster. And a weather forecaster, no one watches weather on TV. But let's just imagine you're watching it on TV. And the weather forecaster comes out and says, it's going to be 50 degrees in New York City today. And there'll be a slight breeze. And, uh, you know, tomorrow it's going to be 52. Okay. So you look to see what people said. And you're trying to understand, well, what, what am I going to do with that? Now, we don't know the context of that statement. And the context of the statement is that it's the middle of summer and you want to go to the shore, you want to go to Coney Island and watch Nathan's hot dog eating championships and, or surfing or swimming, or you want to do something nice outside. And it's like, ooh, 50, 50 degrees and sunny today, that's not going to do it. Well, what if that was actually in, in March and you're thinking about skiing upstate or someplace like that? And it's like, well, this is too hot. So, when we look at numbers, we have to be able to bring something out of the numbers. Okay, that really is the key. Let's take away something outside of the numbers. Okay, let me gain something. And this is what we have to do when we're looking at financial savings. So, yes, there's core aspects of financial savings. And, for instance, one of the things that we have to really recognize is that at the end of the day, you can't spend net income. So a lot of firms focus in on revenue minus expense equals net income. We know out of net income, we can put money in retained earnings. We can give it back to dividends. We can do a bunch of stuff, but you cannot spend net income. Okay. So what do you do with net income? It's a signal. It's a signal of something, but what we can't do is we can't spend it. So you need then to, to connect that through to the cash flow savings and figure out and to develop a cash flow statement guys i need to have the balance sheet okay so there's a lot of stuff that that we have to think about but it's all about bringing together some view as to what these financial statements are telling us um another bullet point here that i, I wrote down is that and this is something again we're gonna we're gonna re-emphasize this through these modules is that the world is risky okay so again when i look at financial statements I'm looking to see what's changed. I'm looking to see what does this tell me about something? What does this change? What does this tell me about the profile of the firm? Not necessarily something definitive, but it's giving me ideas as to what's going on. So when we look at the real world and we look to see, well, who's using these financial statements? Well, investors are using the financial statements. The people inside the firm are using the, the, the statements, the actual people creating the risk, the corporate managers. And then the risk managers are also using the financial statements. And all these parties come together and they have to understand that something that we think is definitive or linear in the mathematical terms, A plus B equals C in all cases, it's not like that. Okay, B 
because in this case, there's risk. And risk tells me that in a certain situation, things may not be as simple as A plus B equals C. Okay, so the fact is, and then it comes down to the, the, to the last big bullet point on this page, and you're going to be paid for your insight. Okay, you know, I work, and I think they, they, they talk about a barbell approach. Okay, so some companies, what they have is they have a lot of new hires, they don't have a lot of depth in the middle, and then they have a lot of older people. Okay, in my in my work, I don't even know how to describe it, actually, but we may have like a huge barbell on one end of the bar with people 45 and older, and then there's not a lot of use at all. Okay, so the fact is, is that when I say to you that your value comes from your assessment, this still happens with older people. If you think honestly that people, people just, I don't understand people, but it, it turns out that many people aren't interested in continuously developing a perspective. So there's people older than me, my age, a little bit younger. And it's like, you know, are they, are they people that I want on my team? And the answer is maybe not because they sit there, they don't ask questions. They, they don't even have a perspective. And so this, this is, this is not a good thing. Right. And so these people aren't valuable. Right. So the teams that are being built, the teams that are getting ahead are those people that sit around and can actually creatively think and thoughtfully think about ideas. So when I when I, we look here at the first sub bullet and I say to you, if we're going to be looking at a financial statement, let's look at level trend and peer. And I, I actually learned this. You know, the core of that comment comes from a young lady that I work with at the Cleveland Fed and at the Cleveland Fed. You know, when I was going through my getting a commission to be a banking regulator, you know, we had to go out in the field and I'm sitting next to her and she says, OK, Pete, she says, this is the way we look at the financial statements. And it was like, OK, that was, you know, it wasn't anything that I didn't know about, but it was just the formality of the comment. And it was a beautiful comment because at the end of the day, this is the core. When you were looking at a financial statement, you have to look at the current level. What does this level mean? OK. What is the trend of the level? And then how does the peer look? So at the end of the day, we'll talk a lot about this stuff, but this is very important, okay? And when I also look at the, the accounting statements, and this is, this, is, this is a great point internally, is that from an internal perspective, okay, firms also manage to a budget or a forecast. And what they do is they take that accounting statement, whether it's a balance sheet or an income statement, and what they do is they, they project that forward, and these are called pro formas. But at the end of the day, they're really looking towards here's the result. And not only is my trend going backwards looking, but I'm also projecting that trend forward to determine, and am I hitting my targets? And there's a whole bunch of things that we think about that is that, and you know, here, here's Pete as your, as your mentor. And I was going to say your dad, but I'll, I'll save that to my kids upstairs, is that at the end of the day, if you set a low bar and you hit it, that's pretty impressive, right? So a lot of times firms will will notice on our perspective that they'll be saying, boy, look at our budget. Look at where we're hitting this and we're hitting our forecast. And then I look to see, well, what, what's the projected forward? If I project my sales are going up half a percent in a strong market, it's pretty easy to hit your bogey when you set your expectations so low. So one of the things that we think about, too, is that when we're looking to see where the firms are going, is this appropriate? Is it too aggressive? Is it too conservative? And if it's too conservative and you hit a low bar, then that's, that's you know, so just like, for instance, if you're taking a corporate finance class uh, and you say to yourself, I'm going in and I really want to get a high grade of a C, I'm really looking for a C in a class. If you get a D, that's not good. You missed your target. But if you get a B, that's all obviously not good either because, you know, at the end of the day, you set a low bar, you exceeded it, but it's still not the A. Okay. Ooh, a lot of stuff there, guys. Okay, so what we have here, and I'm going to kind of look over here at my big screen so I can see this. So we can talk about this, okay, because we're not giving you any inside scoops, okay? So this is an income statement from a firm. And this particular firm, this is actually cut out from their quarterly earnings release. So there's nothing there's nothing at all that that uh, that we have to worry about. But a couple of things that I want to talk about here is that, okay, if you remember 
what bully finance says is that look okay revenue minus expense equal income so over here i'm looking and i'm not certain what you guys can see or whether you can see my cursor floating around or not but the 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 page starts off with revenues and it talks about revenues and then it breaks it down to expenses and then it comes down to net earnings okay and net earnings is basically the same as net income right so lots of times you run into a different verbiage but very generally i don't need to understand a complete picture of what constitutes income i know in every case the income statement is income minus expenses equals some type of or revenues minus expense equals some type of income so for this particular firm the thing that I would say to you is that it's very interesting that I don't know exactly what these accounts really constitute, and I do know what they are. But I'm saying that when you when you are taking your accounting 101, and they don't say, okay, hey, we're going to do an income statement of an investment bank. Hey, we're going to do an income statement of some other firm. The fact is, is that a lot of this stuff you still have to get used to, right? It has to be something that you have to be seasoned with in order to get a good grasp of, right? So, but the bottom line is, is that the revenue minus expense, it's still there. So now I have to just figure out, okay, hey guys, what is the, how, how do I look at the revenues here? And what they do in this case, this particular firm looks at revenue from the source of the revenue. And this is what we call a line of business approach. So for instance, this firm here looks at things from an investment banking perspective, Okay, an investing management perspective, commissions and sales on fees, market making, which is trading activity. And so that's the story. Then they break it down and they say, well, listen, we, so we have a small bank and we're going to have interest income and interest expense. So what we do is we come down to a total net revenue approach. The fact is, again, you may not know what it is you're looking at, but you do know what revenue is. And you know that revenue is always a starting point. So then we get into different things here. And the one thing that I would say is that, like, so you'll see financial institutions would have provision for credit loss. Okay. And what that is, is that that is a pool of funds set aside for loans that are going to go bad. And one of the things that we have to understand is that they use, uh, like, I'm trying to think if I can do this one in my head real quick, an expected loss model which is my expected loss times the probability of that loss times the loss given a default. Okay, so you multiply those three factors together and that gives me what I expect my loss to be in total. My notional amount outstanding of the credit times the probability of that credit going bad times if it does go bad, how much is my recovery gonna be, which is loss given default. So I multiply all those together and at the end of the day, I come up with some predictable amount of what my loss is. So one of the things that you have to understand in both credit loss and legal loss is that you need to have some predictability associated with the expected loss. So I have an event, I have a loan, I have a negative event in terms of legal. It has to have a predictable amount of loss. So what we do is we build in, okay, a amount for the provision for that. And then what I do is I look at my different types of expenses and whatever, and I come down this. But probably most importantly to this graph, when I when I said on the prior spot, slide, level, trend, and peer, level and trend are pretty explicit. So for instance, this firm, if I'm looking at this, this is the way that I like, and actually this is very clean, actually. This is actually a nice display. And so what they do is they give me the year end 2020, they give me the first quarter. So I can see what the firm is doing quarter over quarter. And so what I'm looking at here is I'm saying, ooh, total non-interest revenues are up $6 billion, basically. Okay, that's pretty interesting. And by the way, compared to what they were last year, they're up $11 billion, okay, total non-interest revenues, okay, uh, from March of last year. So there has to be some good stuff going on. And then what I would do is I'd break I break this down and I would say, okay, where do I see the biggest gains, right? So across the board, investment management is somewhat steady. Okay, commissions and fees are somewhat steady, but this particular bank is making money on their trading activity. 
they're making money on principal transactions and they're making money on their investment banking. And so what I've done is I'm able to look at this financial statement and say, period over period, this is how this firm is doing from these lines of businesses. And I can go down through and I can look down through the rest of the, the income statement like that. And on this one side, it tells me the percent change. That's always indicative. So I have the level and the trend. So what I would do is I would take this particular firm and I would say, okay, you know, who would their peer be? So I would say, well, I'm going to go ahead and take the only other pure and or mostly pure investment bank on the street and let's compare them one to one. And that would be Morgan Stanley. So I can, I can benchmark it versus Morgan Stanley. I could also go out to other big U.S. firms and say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and pull out from the financial statements of some of the other big banks that are actually have investment banks too, like J.P. Morgan and Citibank and Bank of America. And maybe in, if they're financial statements, they actually present things on, a, on an investment banking segment, I could go ahead and I could parallel with this. So the bottom line is this is really super important. What do I make out of this? And I'm saying that the level and the trend and then the hypothetical peer is very important. Is this firm? And one of the things that I look at, and and again, this is just me looking at this, is that I, I always make a comment that when the tide comes in, all boats rise and fall, right? So all boats rise and fall when the tide goes in and out. So the quiz question is, is that does this particular firm, are they doing anything better than the tide going in and out. Okay, is there anything unique about this firm? And this is another important takeaway, is that you can see that when the investment, the investment analysts, when the street connectors, when they're when they're helping you try to understand on the quarterly earnings call what the firm is doing, they're always going to spin a tail, right? They're always going to tell you, hey, we're doing great. But let's say, for instance, this this bank's peer, okay, instead of its uh Okay, let's just look at total net revenue. The total net revenue from March of uh, uh, 2020, it went up 102%, which means it almost doubled. And this is true. It almost, well, it's more than doubled. Okay, so at the end of the day, what I can say is that, okay, hey, why did, did, did this other firm do the same? If the other firm tripled, then I could look at this particular firm and say, hey, what's going on? Another thing that I want to let you know about super secretively is that you have to understand the type of business that you're in. And I want to ask you a question about types of business that have cyclical trends, right? So in the investment banking space, and I didn't know this coming out of school, is that the first and second quarters tend to be, over time, the most successful quarters, okay, of, of the year for the investment banks. And... I don't know whether this is true anymore or not. I think it is, right? But the reason why this is the case is that all the trading desks start off at zero when January 1st comes around, right? And at January 1st of the new year, every trader in every position is exactly equal to everybody else in that firm. And so they come out of the gates really strongly and they're trying to push and they're trying to do their best. Summer months slow down. People are going on holiday, right? In the third, in the fourth quarter, what happens is is that uh, there's there's firms where okay the individuals say, well, look, I've had a great first and second quarter, third quarter is held strong. I'm just going to go ahead and try to hold my position, and so trading ends up dripping off a little bit in the fourth quarter. So this, so a lot of these industries actually have trends to themselves, right? And a lot of industries, and we'll drop, we'll pull ourselves back out of investment banking. And we'll look at things like your ski resort. We'll look at your Jersey Shore kind of things where they have a concentration of income being brought in during the summer months or the winter months or whatever it happens to be. But you know what you have to do is you have to figure out, okay, do we have a trend within this firm? So you have an overall trend, right? You know, of the industry going up and down. And then within that, you also have the level and trend of the particular firm. And then we can compare that to our peers. Peers. So this is this is huge. I think this is this is a very nice thing. So the next slide, and this is this is my observations for the income statement, right? And the observations for the income statement is obviously we know this is over a period, so it could be over a quarter, could be over a year. 
And the fact is, is that I think that my second bullet point here, which is about that revenue is the only supportable point from an observation standpoint, I want to say that this is the way that I feel, and I think this is the way a lot of other people feel. Because when you look at an income statement and you look at the complexity of an income statement, see what 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 we saw here with Goldman Sachs. This is pretty this is pretty plain vanilla, where this income statement is blunt force. It's one page. It's pretty nice. It's actually a nice display of an income statement. But the bottom line is that when you start looking at income statements, there are so many one-time events that actually hit a lot of firms. The fact is, is that you have no idea whether or not that firm is doing good or bad. So a uh, uh, for instance would be if a firm got hit with a major legal consequence, right? Or if a firm took a major loss. So here we are sitting in April, 2019 and the financial sector is 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 thinking about the impacts of Archigos, right? Which Archigos was, um, you know, a, a family fund that went bust, right? And some of the large banks took huge hits. So some of these large banks would present their first quarter earnings and say, "Hey, if it wasn't for this negative event, we would have had a nice quarter." And the fact is, from an investor standpoint and an analyst standpoint, or someone working inside the firm. How do you take that type of comment? Do you take it like, okay, you know what? Uh, I'm not gonna really penalize this firm for this large loss. Okay, even though it might reflect negatively on the firm's risk management practices, or do I say, you know what? That was totally a one-time event and I'm gonna ignore that. Okay, because it was just unlucky. Well, firms, are they a series of these one-time events? So you could have, okay, a legal event, you could have a large loss event, you could have a bunch of stuff going on. And the fact is, is that I want to make sure that I'm considering it, but then also considering what the impact would be if this didn't happen. And, you know, one of the things that I'd say here is that when you get into the financial sector and the financial sector, and this is this is actually gap accounting, which by the way, I'm not an expert on, but I have to tell you that there's things that are built in to kind of help level out the playing field. So when we when we're looking at things like debt value adjustment, okay, and debt value adjustment is just like, hey, if if the credit spreads on my bond turn negative, I can actually write that off as a positive and it will even that stuff off. And it's like, well, how does that get into my actual managing and managing of my business? And the experience that I can bring into the street and share with you is that when you're thinking about you know, income. I always, I always think about things from a core and a non-core perspective. And the core is basically the meat and the potatoes of the business. Okay. If I'm a financial institution, okay. Uh, let, let's just say I'm a bank and it's not necessarily an investment bank. Okay. So a plain vanilla bank is making money off loans and collecting deposits. That's the model. Loans and deposits. And at the end of the day, I want to know how good that's doing. And I pull out these one-time events. And I'd say at the core, the firm is still strong. Okay, these one-time events. What is the impact of the one-time events? And then when you start getting into this, this, this theme of always the same type of one-time events hitting year over year, and it might be negative, then you start saying, so that might not be good. Okay, so we're looking at this stuff and we're thinking about the one-time events that are that are impacting okay our accounting so another aspect that that we're kind of familiar with on my side is that you know we're we're looking at things from international and there's international standards which are ifrs versus generally accepted accounting principles which are which are a uh, gap okay and the the fundamental is th there's a couple things that you know and I just wrote these down just to say that if you're looking at an international firm, right, and we're thinking about the contribution that that international firm is making if it's based in the United States, what their impact is from abroad, we have to be able to manage through the fact that the the accounting the accounting principles are different. Okay, so you know what we're saying here is that U.S. is rules. Uh, IFRS is principles. Okay. 
inventory. Now, if I'm looking at inventory, and this goes back to accounting 101, right? And I haven't done I haven't done this. I, I've actually thought about it, but when you get into the street, you don't really think about it. But you're thinking about okay, LIFO versus FIFO. LIFO is for last in, first out. And what this is is this this is an this is an inventory valuation process. Okay. And the fact is, is that a firm, when they're looking at Okay, revenue minus expense, and they're looking at that cost of goods sold, right? So basically, you have revenue minus cost of goods sold is equal to your gross profit. So I can go to that that cost of goods sold line, and I can say, what is my cost of goods sold? So if I sold a hundred widgets, but the hundred widgets I bought, I bought fifty of those things at ten bucks and fifty at five dollars. If I use last in first out and I sold 40 of these things, I could actually reduce the cost. Okay. And that would increase my gross profit just based upon the accounting and the, uh, the accounting approach I use to value my inventory. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of room, right? And so what we have to do is I have an appreciation of all the other kinds of stuff that happens, but at the end of the day, Okay, we have to understand that if we're dealing internationally, there is some uh, there is some differences, and this is challenges that we faced um, actually in the field. Um, you know what? Right now, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, in the financial field about losses, okay, on the credits, right? So there's this new thing coming out, which is Cecil, and under U.S. GAAP, okay, Cecil includes all of the potential loss throughout the term. Okay, IFRS, international standards, it's only a portion of the loss. So the fact is, is that expected losses actually impact US firms a lot harder because we have to recognize it all up front. Okay, where our foreign, okay, uh, businesses can recognize only a piece of that up front. And so then, you know, I drop out of this kind of, talking about accounting and getting people bored about accounting. But here, here's really one of the core features of, you know, hey, look, in the last 12 years, 13 years, since like 2008, 2009, U.S. banks have really outperformed peers. And one of the reasons that we say that is because we had stronger capital standards in the United States. You know, we had more rigorous treatment of accounting. And the fact is, is that this made our banks more disciplined and at the end of the day this might be something that is negatively impacting the european banks at this time okay let's go forward now what is this oh same firm's balance sheet okay and the same firm's balance sheet one of the things that the, in the balance sheet they don't you know this this is my observations about the balance sheet here right now at the end of the day, again, we're getting into a different model. So this isn't stuff that we've learned in Accounting 101, right? This is financial accounting, right? And if I look at this and I'd say to you, do you know what collateralized agreements are? Okay, 80% of people that graduate with a degree in corporate finance don't know what a collateralized agreement is when you're talking about banking. Okay, um, do you know what trading liabilities are? So the goal and objective is, okay, I still know that assets equal liabilities plus equity, okay, so that never changes. And I know what level and trend is, and that shouldn't change. But it is something that you have to just get used to the balance sheet in whatever firm that you're in. So once I arrive at some kind of thought that I'm not going to impress someone and I'm not going to massively spend time preparing to talk about individual balance sheet accounts, but I'm still going to understand it. Look, I can see this balance sheet of this particular firm went up 140 million billion dollars quarter over quarter. And in my world, this is approximately, I think I wrote down 12%. And the quiz question is, is that what type of business would rationally have a balance sheet that would grow 12% in one quarter? So we have to think about why it is that this firm's doing this why it is that this would happen. And again, it's quite natural if you know what the firm is about. So this is an investment bank. 
trading picked up, obviously trading in the first quarter is strong. There's still a lot of volatility in the market. And then when there's volatility in the market, traders can make it, they can have a better opportunity to have a view and they need to trade. People that need to risk protect know that there's volatility in the market and they'll go out and they'll buy risk management product and that will increase the trading revenue as well. Okay, but at the end of the day, you know, assets equal liabilities plus equities, and it doesn't matter if I understand what this stuff is or not. But one of the things that I would say to you is that looking at this, you know, a trend, which is period over period, quarter over quarter, that really doesn't impress me very much. Okay, so if you're looking at something, you know, and I always talk to bankers when I'm talking to them about this, is I'd say, well, you know, so I'm looking at a period of time where let's say, let's say December 31st, 2020 is just that quarter, the fourth quarter of 2020. And in my mind, I actually know the first quarter is usually stronger. So there would be more activity in the financial sector. So how do I know, how do, when I'm looking at this, how do I know what good and bad is? And that should be your goal. How do I know where there's a problem? And the fact is, is that, well, you have to ask, that's the first part of it, but the fact is, is that you also have to have that comfort level, which you can only gain sitting next to someone or sharing perspective is that like, hey, there is this reasonable that this firm, for instance, would have a 12% growth in, in the one year. So it's something to talk about and something to take away. Um, so what we have here is the balance sheet is at a point in time, point in time, click, okay. So another thing, I'll go back, I'll go back to this particular firm here real quick, is that if I'm looking to determine the value of the firm, okay, what is the value of the firm? And maybe there's ways that you can value the firm by the shareholders equity of the firm. Maybe I value the firm by the total assets. At the end of the day, one of the things that I think is a job opportunity for a lot of people, and this is, you know, it, it's what I would suggest is to, Take a look at this and always then think of th think to yourself, how do I stay in front of the curve, right? So what I'm going to suggest here is, is that the ability for firms to be able to bring in all their data from all their lines of business, from all their legal entities, okay, if it's an actual corporation and even if it's an international corporation, I need to be able to consolidate that data. Okay, do I have a data system? that is completely seamless that I can bring in every single account today, take a snapshot of what we have and put out of value the firm. And if I can value a firm and maybe it's on a T minus one lag, okay, T minus two, that's certainly much better than a firm that can only do it quarterly. So what we need to do is you always need to know your position. Think about yourself, right? Uh, like, I think this is a funny story, so, but I'm going to date myself, is that when I went to graduate school, okay, and I'm living by myself, I would balance my checkbook with my ATM card, okay, and I knew if I stuck my ATM card in the machine, and it said you had X amount of dollars in it, I would automatically know that two days ago, P day at Taco Bell, and it cost me $4 for my dinner, bean burritos are quite good. And yesterday, guess where I ate Taco Bell and what I have, bean burritos, and maybe I bought nachos. Okay, but at the end of the day, I always knew that I was within $8 of what it was, what that number was showing. And that you can't do that, to be honest with you. Okay, so as an adult or as a corporation, you know, you think about firms that don't have IT systems that can talk to one another and the inability to create these financial statements, this represents a pretty serious problem. So that, that's an opportunity for you if you're into data and you're into making sure that you understand how MIS systems work and how they can talk to one another. I think that for the next five years, it's a pretty good opportunity set. That stated, I don't know if I would say I can, I believe I'm going to have a 20 year horizon on that stuff because as soon as we figure out, hey, there is a problem that the data doesn't talk to one another and the solution's offered, then it becomes a commodity. Right. And this is where we we have to stay ahead of the curve. And like I would say to you is that like getting back to 101 level kind of stuff is that when you're when you're pounding your books and you're trying to understand, is this an asset? Is this a liability? Oh, my God, my teacher's going to my professor's going to flip out if I put accounts payable as a, as an asset. 
the fact is nobody cares. Okay. The fact is, is that there's these general lectures and I actually did a quick, this is, this is a, a query. This is April, 2021. The top three are Intuit, QuickBooks, Microsoft Dynamics, Oracle, NetSuite, and SAP. These are, these are the automation systems that are out there that are making all this stuff automated, which means to say that you don't need people being bookkeepers and you don't need people doing T accounts and you don't need people doing sweeps and making sure that we have these sub accounts and some general lectures working. It's all done for us. So now we have to say is that that data manipulation is a commodity and that's either done by technology now or shipped off to lower cost resources. Um, in my world, okay, one of the things the takeaways with the balance sheet is, is that the balance sheet has a term structure. Okay, so the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we look at a balance sheet and we say the assets and liabilities should be basically classified from most, most liquid to less liquid. Okay, so this is in a corporate setting, uh, but at the, at the end of the day, in the financial world, one of the things that you have to understand is that going back to one of the premises that we stated before, is that to create value, I need to be looking at each individual transaction that the firm puts on to make sure that transaction, no matter how, how small it is, is value additive, right? So let's go back to Banking 101, okay? And we have Banking 101 at a community bank, which is, let's say they, they give me a 10-year student loan. Pete Damaski signs up for a 10-year student loan, okay? And the bank says, okay, Pete, you borrowed 10 grand off of us and you got to pay it back in 10 years, okay, when you graduate from college. So the firm has a 10-year loan or has a loan to me that they're not going to start collecting for four years if everything goes right. Okay, so then from year four, at the end of year four through the end of year 14, that's my 10-year window. Excuse me if I actually got that wrong. Don't write that in English. But what we're doing is we're thinking about you have a 10-year period starting four years from now. Okay. And this is a loan. And they're charging me 8.5% for that loan. So you would say to yourself, oh, that's a pretty nice return. Okay. But based upon what? Do I know what the, you know, and again, this goes back to some of the other stuff that we were talking about in the first module in terms of, do I actually know what the market rate of interest is going to be in four years? So right now I'm booking this and I'm, I'm earning a revenue and expected revenue, eight and a half percent, but revenue minus expense, what's the expense I'm going to target on that loan? Well, wait a second. It doesn't come with an explicit expense. It's a loan. I have to fund that. So the bank or the financial institution has to get the money to fund that loan today. So what we they may do and what they should do is they should have a system that attaches a cost to each asset. Okay. And if they're a liability, they should have a revenue associated with a liability. So getting back to the to the loan, okay, it's a 10-year loan, right? Starting in four years. They fund it today. But at the end of the day, it's going to be paid back after I graduate through 10 years. So is that a 10-year loan starting four years from now? And the answer is unlikely. It might be for me because I paid off every month as per schedule, but other people prepay. Other people get out and get a job and say, hey, I don't need this student loan hanging around my neck. I'm going to pay off more. And they do. Other people choose to default and they default and they don't pay back at all. So the firm has to be able to model what it is that cost of funds is going to be associated with that known eight and a half percent that they're going to start collecting. This is pretty interesting stuff. And then on the asset side, and the, I mean, let's flip it over to the liability side. If I'm a bank and I'm raising money through a CD or some funding venue, right, or like a savings account or a demand deposit, like a checking account that you may have, the fact is, is that, you know, they know what that costs, okay? They're going to give the consumer uh, 20 bips on their savings account, okay? And that's the expense associated with that liability. But what is that revenue going to be that they're looking to use that for? 
And so what they have to do is they have to give that a fundamental credit in terms of a, a fantasy revenue so that that unit can be evaluated on a cost benefit analysis. Because again, you have a lot of people pushing these different products. Hey, do you want a savings account? Hey, do you want a CD? Hey, do you want this? And at the end of the day, that's just cost going out the door. What is the revenue going to be used for? And we have to be able to do this. So this is actually where, again, if you're a, a student of the game, you can think to yourself, hey, I'm pretty good in mathematics. Maybe there's a way that I could actually study the behavior of these assets and liabilities to better to be able to attack, okay, a funding charge to an asset as well as a credit to a known liability. So I think that's kind of neat. So here we're talking about liquidity on the balance sheet, right? And and this is very important in the financial sector. And you know we go we start off at a one on one level. Liquidity is the ability to turn ca uh, any any asset to cash. Now, at the end of the day, I always put a comment here, which I did not. So I'm wondering why. Okay, but. Liquidity is not only the ability to turn something into cash, but in a cost effective and a timely manner. So when I'm teaching at night at these MBA programs, I say, hey, guys, you know, I need to, you know, me and my wife, I want to take her to Disney World. I'm going to get in trouble because of that, because I never took my wife to Disney World and I never took my kids to Disney World. So I'm going to be in deep trouble. But let's say, for instance, I just needed to take my kids to Disney World. So I needed five grand. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, there's a there's a special not the travel agency, whatever. And I need five grand tonight as a surprise. The only thing I have is the car I have out in the parking lot. So my car is probably worth X amount of dollars, maybe maybe a little bit more than five thousand dollars. But if I said to anybody in a class, hey, the only thing I have tonight, anybody want to lend me or give me five grand, someone would say, well, what do you got? And I would say, well, I got that car out in the parking lot, which is uh, 2015, and it's actually worth book value. It's worth 12 grand. Someone might come out and say, okay, you know what? I, I'm, I didn't test drive it. I don't really know your car. I know that they can, they can Google the, the, uh, the book value. They'd say, I'll give you 6,000 for that. 6,000. So is that liquid or not? Okay, I was able to turn it into cash in, in the short run, but I had to take a huge haircut to do that. And so this is one of the things that we're thinking about when we're thinking about real life liquidity. Now, no one's doing that type of thing, but we all do that type of thing. Okay, not just in the need to get a car and in the one night and you have to, or a vacation and sell your car. The fact is, is that firms very much have to think about their liquidity because, as we say, they have to get through the short run to get to the long run. Okay, so the fact is, is that we're looking at at, at that in terms of liquidity. So I'm looking here and I'm saying to myself, well, we can have signals of liquidity, and signals of liquidity are metrics like current assets over current liabilities, the quick ratio. Which, by the way, Pete Damaski says. 30 years ago, that used to be called the acid test ratio. So if we're looking at here, current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. So what we want to do is we want to say to ourselves, does my current liabilities, are they able to support or is my current assets enough to pay and support the current liabilities that are coming due? So you're looking at cash and accounts receivable and stuff like that. If I'm in a corporate setting, I shouldn't be in a situation where I'm selling my inventory to pay off a current asset. And this is why we subtract out inventory. So that ratio really should be one to one, right? If your if you're quick, quick ratio is less than one to one, this tells me that I need to sell my inventory just to meet my current liabilities. And probably most firms, I'm trying to think, you know, and again, I'm not an accounting specialist, but I'd be hard pressed to figure out, does that make good sense? Okay, to sell off current assets, okay, in turn or your your inventory to meet to meet something. Okay, so if I'm a retailer in a box store in a mall, which is all closed, should I have to sell my shoes? Like you know, it's kind of at the end of the month where the bills are coming due, and so you go in and you notice that uh, 
you know, they have to sell inventory. That's not the way it should be. Okay. So another thing that we're concerned about in our, our world is like, how are these, how, how are the assets priced? Okay. And so we, we have techniques, which are called mark to market. You have book value. Book value is just the stated price when you, when you put it on your books, right? Okay. Hey, Pete bought a car for $20,000. Okay, so every year I write down twenty thousand dollars on my assets that I have twenty thousand dollars. Well, okay, but another way we can look at this is mark to market, and mark to market was at the root of the downfall of some firms like Enron, which what they could do is they can mark to market certain things and turn that into a profit. And I know that's connecting the income statement and balance sheet, but they could take advantage of that. The bottom line is is that mark-to-market accounting is a positive development, especially where we have very short-term assets, okay? Because at the end of the day, I can't run a trading business without knowing today's market value, what I have on my books, okay? If I have something that is 30 days old and you see how quickly the interest rates go up and down, and when the interest rates go up, down, there's an inverse relationship between the market rate of interest interest and the value of an asset. And you can look at that equation that we put out in module one. If present value equals future value divided by one plus I to the N, as I goes up and down, that does impact the present value. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff that we need to know, right? So mark to market is very valuable, especially in a trading book. When I told you I take a snapshot of the value of my firm in a balance sheet, this is a very important factor. Right. So it's kind of important. Okay. Now we also have another valuation technique, which is called mark to model. Okay. And mark to model approach is one of these things that you, you run into where there's not a liquid market. There's not an actively traded market for what it is the underlying asset class is. Right. So when that occurs, okay, someone builds a model and says, this is what I think should be the value of this product based upon history, based upon all my uh, conjectures built into that model. And this is kind of what we call like a level three asset, which is something that you're estimating and you're using these models. And generally, I think that using a model is better than nothing, but it might not be a hell of a lot better than nothing. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff that we, that we have to consider, especially if you're using that valuation for anything that's important for yourself. Okay. Hey, we're going to do this in one session. So here's a statement of cash flows. And I, I, I have to apologize to you because, you know, when I looked at some of the formal statement of cash flows for this particular firm, it really just was out of control. Okay. Many pages. So what we do is we state to you before I even look at this slide, I basically have where I ended my cash, so whatever the end of the period is, so let's say it's the end of 2020, I have a cash balance on my balance sheet. And what I want to do is I want to do a waterfall approach to take that cash flow and to say, this is where I'm at in the next period. So I start off with the cash flow at the end of the last period, and I add to that cash flows from operations. And what you have to think about, and I would say you have to understand, because if you start thinking about this stuff, you'll end up going crazy, is you have to look at each balance sheet account and you have to say to yourself, okay, beside the cash balance, if my account, if my accounts receivable goes up, is that a cash inflow or an outflow? If my accounts payable go up or down, is that a cash inflow or outflow? So everywhere down the line, you have to be thinking about Okay, is this a cash inflow or outflow when we talk about operations? Okay, and then we have cash flow from financing, which is if you go out into the uh, funding markets and I issue stock and I bring in funding that way, or I buy back stock and there's money going out the door. Is that a cash inflow or out outflow? And then finally is your cash from investment. And this is taking your longer term assets and saying, hey, look, if the value of my factory was at a hundred million dollars here and now it's 200 
is that a cash inflow or an outflow? And you have to be able to think about what impacts that. But at the end of the day, what happens is you've just done a reconcilement between what my cash ended in the last period and what it is in this period. Okay, so if it's 100 and now it's 110, I've been able to define what, what it is that constitutes that $10 increase in my cash flow through operations, through financing, and through investment. So this little, this little slide here is somewhat convoluted, but all the elements are here. So I look here and I'm looking at this particular firm is presenting to us our cash uh, beginning balance. So it starts off 2020, okay, at $15 billion, $15.2 billion. Okay, and then in this case, what we're doing is we're gonna add to that our cash flow from operations, right? So this is a positive number. So my beginning balance plus cash flow from operations. And here, because of the type of firm, they get some benefit on their FX, foreign exchange. And so, yes, they did not put in their uh, their financing and investments, broke them out exactly like that. But at the end of the day, we're able to see how that cash balance generated. So one of the things that I would look at here is I would say, okay, comparing 219 to 220, the cash generated from this firm, let's say in 2019, let's say that was approximately a little bit over $600 million. Okay, you go forward to, uh, you know, year 2020, and now we're looking at over $10 billion. So there's the there, there's a lot of positive cash flow generation out of the firm in year 2020. So, I, I'm going to wrap this chapter up by just talking about where do you get perspective. So again, one of the things that we're looking at is like, hey, you know, module two, like I think it's very interesting, and I think it's it's again a very level setting type of discipline and effort. Not necessarily something that's going to blow your socks off and say, wow, I want to come back and check out Bully Finance for this. But look, it, we're not all about making excitement. We're here to have fun. But we're also here to make sure that you walk out of here gaining perspective with of topics that you're being taught formally at your schools and that we can say, hey, this is this is how we think you can actually add even more value when you go out to interview for your jobs. OK, so what we want to do, too, is if we're looking at perspective on the financials and I'm going to tell you this is that I honestly believe that I'm in love with the investor web pages of of firms. Okay, and believe it or not, okay, I will go out to the banks that we cover and I will try to either get their earnings live or I will definitely listen in to the investor questions, you know, on a replay because this is the perspective that, look, at, I'm utilizing a hundred set of eyes to ask questions about this firm that I wouldn't even think about, or maybe I'm thinking about and I want someone else to ask a question. At the end of the day, this is huge. So the investor webpage. So the investor webpage has all your quarterly earnings, but it actually has the firm. Now, this is another thing. The firm goes out and through their investor relations, they put on presentations to their equity holders. They put on presentations to their debt holders. And so they're reaching out to the investors and putting on presentations that they want you to take away from the firm. And that's OK, but that's a skewed perspective, too. Right. OK, but it is it's it's good perspective. OK, I need to know the firm. And one of the things that I don't want to necessarily do, and I think it goes down to the last bullet point on this page is, hey, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to social media and I'm going to get all my scoops off social media. Hey, you know what? Social media is not bad because that that's another angle of the 360 that I utilize occasionally, but I'm not going to depend on the media because I was going to give you an example of my son who made a comment about something the other day, but I can't remember what it was. But the gist is, is that, you know, if someone takes time to complain or make an opinion, normally it's it's complaining because 
you you have some oh i know what it was he was complaining about standing in line at a restaurant okay and he said that you stood there and stood there and stood there so he goes out to their web page and you know i guess that it's very easy now to go out to the yellow pages or whatever the the internet is about the firm and actually post a negative comment 90 percent of your comments if someone has if someone's angry they're more more willing than not to go out and make a complaint, right? So when you're talking social media, you know what? It's like, you know, every once in a while there's a little bit of smoke, and you might say, "Does that represent a fire?" It might give you some ideas. But the bottom line is, the best source, I think, comes from the firm itself. And then when we look at the earnings reports that they normally put out on a quarterly basis, and after the after the CFO and the CEO get done talking about the earnings performance. What happens then is that the street analysts, the, and when I say the street analysts, every one of the other big banks actually have analysts following this company. And it's not like they, they, they ask difficult, difficult questions to embarrass the CEO and CFO, but they ask thoughtful questions. Hey, can you tell me why your income's so low? Hey, can you tell me the impact of this massive loss you're going to have this quarter and what the impact of that is going to be going forward? And they're asking these people on your behalf, and this is great. So at the end of the day, what we like to think about is generate an idea from a 360 perspective. Okay, and again, you know, and the point that I said, I'm not gonna be negative, but one of the things about your professors at your schools, if you're using those guys and gals to be the source for your 360 perspective, and these are the people that aren't taking the lead in research, and these are the people who graduated a middle grade school and their whole experience is studying a book and studying a PowerPoint deck and, and writing that PowerPoint deck for you without sharing the perspective of the street. This is really a weakness. And this is one of the reasons why you're not getting hired. Okay. And so you have to actively take, take it and do stuff for yourself, but you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, it's kind of unfortunate that there's probably way too many professors that are unable to shed light like just bs and like me today so sorry about that guys hey we're plowing ahead okay so let's go to our last slide so i i look here and i say about employment opportunities and just some just some observations that i have is that sales still drives the cycle right so one of the things that you have to figure out to do is and I'm not necessarily saying sales on Wall Street because I was thinking about sales on Wall Street. There's a lot of algorithms. There's a lot of technology that's now coming into sales, a lot of AI that's coming into sales. And what's going on is that that's, that's reducing the, the number of people necessary, but sales still drives the cycle. So even thinking about sales, if you're in a corporate setting, you have to go pound the street and you have to get a contract it's a great thing to do, right? Because you appreciate what the problems are with the people. So an example is when my first job, I came out, I was selling copies and fax machines. The number one problem that most of these people had is that they didn't want to be disturbed by me. So I had to create and recognize and try to get through to them of problems that I recognize that I could be the answer to. And that's a very useful kind of concept, right? So, but, but, at the end of the day, when you sell something, the salespeople are solving problems, okay? And they're working on teams to solve a problem. And they're working on teams to prepare a pitch to go out on the street and sell something. And this is a very useful thing. You're working as a team, you're solving a problem, okay? Um, if you're looking at future employment, what we think is the future of employment is, is that, you know, again, basics 101, when we look at the firm and we say, hey, I go to the income statement, revenue minus expenses equal income. And when my revenue, when the industry becomes more competitive and my revenue is steady, it might be going down and it doesn't look good for enhancing my revenue on the front end. The next thing I have to do is look at my cost. And when you're a cost center, when you're working in a back office and you're an HR rep, or you're a bookkeeper, an accountant, or a financial analyst, the firm is gonna be looking at you and saying, you know what, as a financial analyst, you're not bringing in money in the front door of this firm. 
So I look at your job scope, and unless you're ready to step up and take more responsibility, it might be your job that gets sent to another part of the country, which is cheaper to work in. Your job might be going to a foreign country where it's a little bit cheaper than going someplace in the United States. Your job might be turned into into a quick book, right? Which is gone. Okay. So this is the story with that. Okay. Um, we want to help you keep ahead of the curve and get your foot in the door. Okay. And the bottom line is, is that there's no one here to give you something. I don't think it's right for a firm to say, you know what, you 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 look nice and you deserve a job. We're going to pay you a lot of money. No, I mean the firm. If we go back to the basics, is here to create value for the shareholders, and the value is consistently defined to be putting the firm in position positions where each and everything that they do has an expected return greater than the cost. And this is this is the story. Okay, so. What we're going to do here is I want to just again remind you, uh, try try your best to increase the skill sets that you have, right? And we think bully finance is a great opportunity for you to hear perspective from the street, okay? And it's not a complaining standpoint. It's not like, oh, we failed and we couldn't get a job. No, we're gainfully employed, happy with our jobs, have real good jobs. And at the end of the day, we just see that there's a, there's an opportunity set for you that can be enhanced, right? So, guys, again, never go into a battle with unarmed, and we'll see you around for Module 3. Take care and have a good day.